if you think process, you think it, it's the flow that connects it all together. Yes. And if you don't think that way, you end up isolating your company into boxes and treating them separately. Welcome to Process Pioneers, the show that takes a deep dive into the minds of decision makers, key influencers, and process experts who are pioneering the world of everything process. Welcome to another episode of Process Pioneers. My name is Daniel Rayner. I'm the host of Process Pioneers. And in each of these episodes, I have the absolute privilege of sitting down with uh, different business process management uh, professionals or, and practitioners, those that are putting uh, BPM into practice each and every day, whether they're working internally at an organization, whether they're working as a, as a, a consultant or whether they're in the realm of academia and um, as a professor or a lecturer. Um, and today I have the absolute privilege of sitting down with Paul Harmon, uh, which most of you listening to this will probably know. Now, Paul is the executive editor at BP Trends and is also the author of the book Business Process Change, uh, which is a very well-known book in the BPM space. Paul, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. And what we might do to begin with, Paul, is uh, that was obviously a very brief introduction to who you are. Uh, but for those that, that maybe they haven't heard your name before or they haven't read your book, maybe you can take us on a bit of a journey back to when you were first introduced to the idea of business process management and then take us on a journey leading up to today. Okay, I can try. Uh, <laughs> I'm old. That'll take a while. <laughs> I... Really, in the course of my life, I've had three careers. My first career I think of as primarily an instructional technologist where I designed instructional materials. My second career was with computers. Uh, I became an expert on expert systems for a while and spent a lot of time there. And then my third career is being a business process person and spending time there in all cases. Mm. There's been a, both a heavy consulting element and also a heavy um, element of education and communication. Right. Uh, in any case, let's start with, say, the mid-60s. I graduated from college. I went to work for what in the United States was called a job corps center. We trained kids was basically what it came down to. I was hired from there to go to work in New York for Xerox Corporation which had a, what they call the learning systems group. And they were primarily to teach people about different kinds of instruction. Right. Ended up moving from there on to another group called Praxis with a couple of people there that had set up the field of program instruction and educational technology. Right. The gist of it was that one of those guys was Gary Rumler. And Gary Rumler, again, he started off taking a, a doctorate in business He'd specialized in instructional technology. And then he moved from that into consulting and helping companies improve, pro solve problems. Yes. It turned out to be process work. Right. Um, in the course of the time in the 60s that I was with Gary, he developed a whole series of tools, including a flowchart that today would be BP, a BPM flowchart, which would show organizations across one axis and it would show time on the other and you would see the flow of a business process and who in the company handled what. Right. And we didn't think of that as process at the time. We thought of it as instructional improvement. Right, okay. We certainly didn't think about computers. There were no computers, I mean, there were computers but the few computers that existed in 1965 were in the back room, they were mainframes, and they handled a very narrow range of subjects like accounting or personnel and so forth. Right. And we didn't think of computers as our concern. We thought of people. People didn't perform their jobs correctly. And our task was to figure out what they should do and then teach them to do it. Right, right. So, that was my beginning with process. Although at the time, if you'd asked me, am I a process person? I just said, no, I'm a, I'm a instructional designer. I help people design training programs. Um, in the, I, several things happened. I ended up in San Francisco. I ended up running my own company 
I did a lot of work with banks in the Bay Area. I also did a lot of work with computer companies that were starting up in Silicon Valley. Right, okay. In the process of working with computer companies, I particularly got into companies that were trying to commercialize artificial intelligence with the things they called expert systems. Right. There's, there's AI today, and it's a little bit different. But in the 1980s, the AI that existed was to design software systems that could do what a human expert could do. Right, I can. If a physician could analyze meningitis infections, they wanted to build a system that could do that. Well, I was interested in training, and so this was very interesting to me. Yes. But the way they did meningitis analysis was they sat a physician down, and they asked him, what do you do? And he would explain what he did. And then it became mostly cognitive, that is to say mental rather than observable. Right, right. Obviously, when I thought of task analysis, I would have said, you sit and watch what somebody did on an assembly line. They yes. Up, they move them, they put them in place. You studied what they did, you worked out the best way to do it, and then you taught people to use that procedure. Yes, right. I already knew I was in trouble by the 80s because there were lots of cognitive tasks that just don't work that way. They right. You can't observe it. Yes. An expert system, they would sit with a physician and they'd say, how do you solve this problem? What do you ask? And they would work out the rules, the business rules or the, the rules of thumb that the human expert used. And this isn't trivial. The expert systems would have 5,000, 10,000 rules that would analyze all the permutations and combinations. Yes, right. And they built really good expert systems. They built systems that could do as well as human beings in some areas. So I ended up, first of all, studying that, and then up teaching courses about it for companies. And then when the companies were moving on and starting to sell software tools, I moved, I started, I set up a new, well, I wrote a book. I wrote a book called Business Expert Systems, AI and Business. And I was lucky enough that book was first out in the market, first commercial book out in the market. It right. Very well. Yeah. So I became sort of an instant expert. You know, yes. A hint for all the observers. You want to become <laughs> an expert, you write a book. Uh, I'd, written, I'd written 50 technical papers on things and didn't become an expert. I became an expert. <laughs> In any case, I, I then spent 10 years, basically 15 years, watching the expert systems market and reporting on it. And I shifted from being a real consultant that, that actually went in and helped a company build an expert system. And I became a consultant that wrote a monthly newsletter. Every month I'd write 16 pages and it would go be mailed out. This was a day of paper. This is yes. a free computer. Even though <laughs> I'm writing about computers. <laughs> I use I use the internet, but it was a very clumsy thing to use in those days. Right. It had the advantage of teaching me a lot about computers. In any case, I spent 15 years basically working on cognitive subjects and computer subjects. Uh, when expert systems started to fade, and they did, they faded in about the beginning of the 90s. And the reason they did, the tools could build expert systems. But the expert systems couldn't, they were very expensive to maintain. You could spend, it took a lot of time to get an expert to give you 10,000 rules on how to analyze a meningitis infection. Right, and right. Every, any in the world of experts, in the world of experts, things change rapidly. Yes. New, new papers are published, new studies are undertaken. People find out new things. A real expert reads some large number of books every year and they go to several conferences just to keep up to date. Right. So any expert system you built was going to have to be able to be updated constantly. Yes. It turned out it was almost as expensive to update them as it was to hire the experts. So it wasn't a good solution. Right. Uh, today's AI, which is very active and people are very interested in, today's AI is based on neural networks and they learn by themselves. In other words, you right. give them examples and you tell them this is correct and they develop a model and then every time they run an example, they know whether it's correct or not and they modify 
Right. They, they, they learn. Yes. Uh, and this has become the key to today's world of AI. So AI went up in the 80s, it went down, it disappeared, and it started up again in about 2010, and it's going ahead right now. Yeah, I can. Anyway, I, as expert systems started to fade, I got into other areas of, of high-tech computing. And then at some point I said, I want to go back to what I used to do. So I contacted Gary Rumber and I said, why don't we write a book on business process? Uh, Gary didn't want to do a book, but he encouraged me to do it, and I did. So I wrote a book, Business Process Change. And my approach to business process was different than most of the other books that were out there. Right. Partly because of where I came from. In other words, I, a lot of the book, let's, let's look at the business process market broadly. In the 80s, you have experts, you have um, Six Sigma and maybe a little bit of Lean. Mm. Very popular, very much derived from the Japanese experience and from process uh, engineering experience. Very much oriented towards people, mm. getting mm. people to improve processes. Very much in the tradition of both Gary and I when, in the 60s. Yes. In the 90s, you have business process re-engineering. Business process re-engineering is an IT-led movement. I mean, Hammer and Davenport and people like that were, were concerned that computers allowed companies to revolutionize the way they organized process. Right. Hammer basically said, we started, companies started using computers and they didn't know what to do with them. And so they picked out one particular thing, how to do accounting or Mm. how to keep track of the payroll. And they build an expert system to do that. Yes, and right. Now, 10 years later, we look back, none of the systems talk to each other. They're not connected. There's no overview. We need to just rip that out and build. He said, you know, we need to stop paving cow paths and build super highways. Right. And the idea was we were going to build big process, computer supported automated processes that would make companies much more efficient. Yes. And business process re-engineering kicked that off. It went for a while. It declined at the end of the 90s. Again, different reasons. Uh, mostly they promised too much. Right. I mean, one of the early examples Hammer used in, and again, we're talking 1991, 92. One of the big examples he used was that we would connect all these software systems together and have them send messages back and forth. Right, okay. Today, that's trivial. Yes. The internet has standard protocols that allow us to move anything anywhere. Mm. In 1991, there, were no, well, there was no internet standard and no protocols of that kind. And people who built those systems had to hand build them. Right. Large companies could build interconnected systems by having enough programmers to program the connections. Yes. A small company couldn't do that. They just simply couldn't. So yes. a lot of what was promised couldn't be delivered for any reasonable cost. Right, so okay. There's a sort of a, a slow decline of the expert systems. I'm sorry, <laughs> of the business process re-engineering engineering systems at the end of the 90s. In the early zeros, you get the internet, you get the software, various social media, you get a whole new common standard across all the computer environments. And suddenly in 2003, you get uh, Peter Finger, Howard Smith writing a book that says we can do business process re-engineering using the, the XML protocols from internet and we can make all this work seamlessly. Yes. And what they, they proposed was building software that allows us to build a model of the process and then have the process model generate the code to connect it up and send right it. okay that got very exciting that got a huge hit by i was lucky enough i knew nothing about howard smith and fingers book i wrote my own book which came out at the same time and my emphasis was on pulling everything together mm, their mm. emphasis was on a particular technique right tools to accomplish a particular technique. 
So it worked very well together. You had a lot of people who were interested in what they were doing, but knew nothing about computers. Yes. And I, I sort of offered a book that said, there's different aspects to this. There's building an architecture. There's handling the people side of the problem. There's handling the software side of the problem. Yes. You can use, you can use Lean and Six Sigma if you want, or you can use, et cetera, other methods. So trying to get people to think that this was a, a broader movement that incorporated a lot of different things. Yes. The, the important thing from the market's point of view is that Smith and Finger created a market for software the software vendors put a lot of money into it. There were conferences, there were meetings around the world and people got very excited about process again. And so it went up and there was a huge attention and I sort of rode that up. Um, I created the website in relation to the book just to continue on talking about the issues in the book. Mm. The website became the only website around at that time that was available for people who wanted to talk about all these process issues. Yes. So we got all kinds of people voluntarily showing up and writing articles. And it became very exciting for about five years. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't last. In other words, a couple of things. One thing is few people submit articles to websites anymore because they can put them on their own blog. Right. The world, the world keeps changing and you have to yes. switching strategies to deal with it. In any case, um, I today, you, you, when we were talking before we started, you said, you know, what, what is it like today? There's a law in the market. The, the right. market is slow. There was, there was Six Sigma, business process re-engine, business process management. Now there's, there's nothing that really has, generates a lot of excitement. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. In other words, process goes through its ups and downs. There's a, 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 a background movement of people doing process work all the time. Yes. Process don't work. New tools come along. People turn over. There's all kinds of reasons why a company needs to maintain its processes. Yes. But things get exciting when there's some technology that lets people think they can make a real big jump in efficiency. Right, right. So that's at the moment. There's, there's not that excitement isn't there. The yes. Pandemic. <laughs> and the problems we have with that. Yes. Uh, there's no great excitement there, and so senior management is looking at other issues. You know, they're looking at how to deal with the pandemic. They're looking at whether they're going to go bankrupt or not. Uh, they're looking at accounting issues. Uh, they're looking at people issues. You know, do people continue to work at home? So there are a lot of issues that management's focused on and process is in high priority. Yes. Several years, from 2003 to 2008, the process, improving business process, led almost every list that when you ask senior management, what do you care about? Ah, number right. Number one or number two. Yes. It's not now, I don't know where it is, but it's not anywhere near number one or two because other things have just suppressed become more important okay. yes it'll move back but it'll just be a matter of getting excited again if yes I had, if I had to guess i'd say some tool based on ai or artificial intelligence yes somebody will find some way of using artificial intelligence to to do something particularly good with process and then people will get all excited again and there'll be a lot more interest in right in big things in yes in big processes Anyway, um, that's a lot of background. No, that's. Let's stop there and let's. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. That, that thanks for sharing all of that. I think that um, you know different. I think if you haven't seen process being done well, business process management being done well, um, then you don't realize the full potential there. Uh, I think that there, there's an organization, a large telecommunications company here in Australia um, that, um, that they come to mind when, when talking about uh, 
like putting process BPM into, into practice and using it really effectively. Um, the, the, the CEO, and especially down from that executive level, the, the CEO, if anyone approached the CEO about a, a problem or a challenge that they were facing in their organization, the CEO would always ask that, that person, what is the process? And if that person didn't understand the process, he would say, go away have a look at the process, understand the process. When you know what the process is, come back to me and then we'll be able to find the solution because without understanding the process, we're not going to be able to um, work out the solution. He's, he's a rare CEO. <laughs> if you ask me what's the most important thing to getting really good process work done at a company, I'd say senior management. Right. Um, if you take a course, if you take an MBA course, business management course at Harvard, you won't run into a course that's really called business process. Right, right. And you'll get some business process in operations. But business process, as, as we're using the term, is not really a first class player in the world of business management. Right. And I don't know why. I mean, we people who believe in process have been working at it since 1910. Yes. Trying to convince management that there's, you know, there's one way of looking at the world is, is accounting. You add the numbers up and you find out whether you're making money or not. And then you find out who's spending money. Yes. Et cetera. And that's, that's certainly a very valid way to look at the world. Yes. Uh, another way is command structures. You know, who reports to who? And if, if X isn't working right, you fire the guy that's in charge of that and you hire somebody else yes. to make changes in what's going on there. And another way of looking at the world is the process view, which is looking from the beginning, watching something flow through the organization from beginning to end. Yes. And instead of thinking of that hierarchical structure that has one department here and another department here, you look at a process that runs across all the departments mm. and it's for those who get it, <laughs> it seems obvious, you know, yes. the telecom guy you mentioned clearly gets it. Yes. And so you want to want to know that if you don't get it, then somehow process becomes little, you know, it's a matter of just getting, getting the guy to do the thing right. And you yes. Think about, is he doing it right or wrong because he got the wrong information in training? Yes. Is he doing it right or wrong because parts don't arrive when they're supposed to, and he can't do it until mm. the parts arrive? Or yes. Is he doing it wrong because he sends it to the people downstream, and it isn't really what they want, and they send it back and say, this isn't what we need. Right. So, I mean, if you think process, you think it's, it's the flow that connects it all together. Yes. And, if you don't think that way, you end up isolating your company in the boxes and treating them separately. Mm -hmm. and there are all kinds of problems you run into. Yes. And these process people have been yelling about this for years, uh, but it hasn't caught on. Yes. Um, maybe I mean, one of the things that came out of this round, the BPM round of process, was the establishment of BPM groups in, in universities. Right. There really hadn't, there hadn't been a department that called itself process before. And even many of the BPM groups really think of themselves as IT groups. Right, some right. Some of them don't. Some of them are in the business part department. Some of them talk about business process with an emphasis on management. Yes. And, and, and they really are, it's, we'll see what they do. Maybe yes. They'll develop a, a strong enough academic structure that they'll be well that they can be represented at the at the table with senior management. Yes, right. But until that happens, it depends on individual senior managers getting the notion that process is the way to look at things and insisting on it. Yes. And I mean, I've done all the all the great process work I've done has been done with companies with senior management that got that message. Yes, Ron. Get it for a while. I mean, you think of Jack Welch. Uh, yes. GE. Mm. You know, I mean, GE putters along doing whatever it does. It gets Jack Welch. Jack Welch decides that Six Sigma 
and it makes no difference what you call it. It could have called it VPM or VPR, but he, but process was the way it worked. At, at the, within two years of his saying that, he'd actually instituted a program where 20% of the salary of the senior managers at GE depended on their process results. Wow. I mean, serious process. Yes. So, so then for 10 years under Jack, GE makes wonderful progress. Unfortunately, like anything else, Jack, Jack retires, somebody else comes in, somebody complains that things are over budget and they decide what that the next CEO should really be an accountant. And the accountant <laughs> starts issuing rules about how each department is gonna keep track of money and things shift away. You know, it, it doesn't mean it goes away altogether. Yes. It takes, it takes a constant concern and you need somebody who's enthusiastic and serious. Yes. And some companies have them and some don't and some get them and then lose them. Yes, yes, right. And, and if there was someone listening right now that they're part of an organization where maybe they don't have that enthusiastic uh, senior management um, team on board, they don't have that buy-in, that sponsorship, um, but they they have a particular interest in process management. Maybe they've even been put in place. And I, I know a few examples of individuals that are that have been given the um, the process design lead title. One person in a company of four thousand people. Um, so it, it isn't it isn't given a lot of time, effort, and energy resources. Um, but how, how do you get buy-in from senior management? Is it possible to um, get that buy-in, get that sponsorship, or is it, is it too much of an uphill battle if, um, if that senior management isn't already on board? It's, it's definitely an uphill battle. <laughs> and, you know, if I, if I knew someone who I thought was really good at process, and they ask me, what do I do? Senior management doesn't care. I'd say, get another job. Right. You're, you're never going to be, you're never going to make the kind of impact you, you want to make. Yes. If that senior management won't support it. And if you've got a management that isn't there, you want to look for a company where the management, where you different management. Right. Now that's not real for most people in the world. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's process is really your thing then it's one thing if it's not then there's all kind you want to and you like the company and you like the location then there are other things to do you can certainly i mean the, the way to get people to notice process is to succeed yes and, the, and the, you can make success by very small focused projects you know you you get a departmental head you get your particular management, you start working, uh, you're going to have to be not only a process person, but a PR person at the same time. <laughs> you're going to have to promote what you do and get people to notice and point it out. Yes. You know? But you can, you can make some progress that way. But I mean, the, the point that Hammer made is still valid. The, the problem with Lean and Six Sigma and with any incremental approach is that you won't get excitement from senior management if you're saving hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. You need to be saving millions yep. or more yep. to, yes. to get attention. Right. You don't start saving that and, and having it noticed that you're saving it if you're not working on a pretty big piece of the puzzle. Right. You, you, if you're if you're inside a department working on a particular, the help desk, and you make the help desk twice as efficient as it was, that's a, it's exciting in one way, but it's kind of ho-hum in another. I mean, right. the help desk is better, so what? <laughs> uh, you know, introducing a new product line is exciting. Uh, right. Getting, taking a process that, you know, takes up days to do and cutting it down to hours or minutes is exciting you, you mm. just reduce the cost dramatically yes and yeah people, people notice that so you want to if you if you can't do what anything more than work on a small process you can do it and there are all kinds of tools to help make it happen
Yes. It won't make your career. It won't make you Mr. Process at that company. Yes. It, it won't get the whole company turned around saying, how do we do more process? Right. So you want to look, you want to look for some way to get your hands on a big piece of the puzzle. Sometimes it's just a matter of standing up. In other words, I, one of the companies in the United States that does chemicals, they build chemical plants and they started buying companies abroad. And then they got a CEO in who was an accountant actually. But he said, basically, everybody in every one of these plants abroad is doing it differently. Right. It's costing a fortune. And, you know, we ought to figure out how to make them more similar. And this guy was in the meeting and he put his hand up and said, I know how to do that. That's a process job. We need to bring them together, sit them down and standardize their process. And he hit at the right time and the right guy. And the guy said, do it. And, you know. When I interviewed them, he had 150 people working for him. Right. Standardize these processes. I mean, this is I mean, building a chemical plant is a big money item. You know? Yes. So if you, you know, if they can spend a lot of money to get it straightened out, and they did. They, yes. They had, they had the, they flew these guys in from all over the world. They'd sit them down in the room. They'd say, what's the best way to do X? What's the best way to set up a new oil refinery? Right, right. And, and you know, flow the whole thing out in a big, long standard diagram. In any case, it, it, it was good work. And the guy, you know, it was partly just his being aggressive enough and being in the right room at the right time and beating everybody else to the punch and saying, I yes. <laughs> so anyway, that's a long answer to the question. Yeah, and no, I think that that's it's very important. And I think what you were saying about um, the, the sm getting those small wins or, or succeeding, you know, it's it's got to be, it's got to be something that achievable, something that you know it's not going to be a you know a two year, three year piece of work because um, the executive team they're going to be sort of tapping their fingers on the table, being like, well, when's when am I getting my return on investment? Like, how long is this going to take? And you know, in two three years time, the team might have changed so much that um, the people that are now in place don't understand the the why behind. Why are we doing this? Why are we understanding our processes? Everyone already knows how to do the job. Why do we need to understand that? Can't they just keep doing the same job they've always been doing? You know, what's wrong with that? Um, and so you need to have those, those small wins, but as you were saying, they need to be significant. Um, executive, the executive team, they're not gonna get all excited about a couple of, couple of dollars saved, so. Okay, let me, let me respond to that because that's a, a slightly different question. One is, if you're in a company and you, there's no help for you and you're supposed to be doing process, what do you do? And the answer is usually pick a small process well within a department and you work on that. That's the answer to that. A separate question is you've got a project to do and how do you do it? Yes. When, when I used to work with Gary Rumbler in the eighties, you know, we would sit down with a company and flow the whole process out. And I mean, we did a lot of work with automobile companies, including building the flow plan for the Ford plant that was going to be built in Brazil. Wow. And that's a huge thing. That comes yes. walls of material. Yes. Flow plans, because you're specifying every job in that production line. Yes. And every job. And that made sense to Ford because at the time, they thought of building a car as a six or seven year process. Right. We start out and do the design and we test it and we build the prototype, et cetera, et cetera. And seven years from now, we start rolling it out to the dealers. Right. So putting in two years of building a flow diagram for a new plant in Brazil didn't seem unreasonable. You know, today, that would just be nonsense. There are very few companies that will sit and wait for two years to have a process analyzed. Yes. If, if you're in the position where the senior management cares about process and you've got some sort of flexibility about what you do, you do not want to get into doing that. Right, right. You don't, the, the idea, oh, you have a process problem, we'll, we'll flow it all out. It's just gonna be a waste of time. The people who don't want you to do it are going to be saying, hey, it's been six months and we haven't seen 
major improvements. Yes. What you want is techniques that allow you to look at process in a very high level way. Get the get the flow plan out, but get it as a flow plan with six big boxes in it, you know, and then go back and figure out how figure out how to use metrics to show you where a difference would make a difference. Yes. Okay. And then focus on that. In other words, yep. spend if it, whatever you want to call it foreplay, you know, don't go into deep analysis, do an initial analysis and figure out where you'll get the biggest bang for the buck quickly. And then focus on that. Yes. And the rest of the process will not be improved. And yes, it could be improved if you had the time, but who has the time? Right. Right. I mean, Another way of looking at it would be to say, you know, look at how companies are being formed these days by computer people. You know, yes. They start off and they say, I want to form a company. Hey, I've got this idea. We'll have the computer system do this. And they start fiddling around to make the computer system do that. Right. They don't worry about accounting. You know, they go out and they hire some software package to do accounting. Yes. You know, they don't worry about personnel. There are packages from HR that you buy that do all the HR. Right. And so the, the idea of building a company architecture and spelling everything out in detail, it, it works for a few old line companies that are very set in their ways. Right, they right. Work for new companies. They want to move very quickly. Yes. They want to focus on the where they're going to make money, you know. And if, as, a, as a process person, that's what you want to do. You want right. To, Look at the company, think about where can I make a difference in the process that will really go right to the bottom line. And then you want to sell that to senior management. I can help make this happen. Yes. Okay. So yes, you know, do not, do not get into long-term analysis. It's death. <laughs> death by analysis. Is yes. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah. <laughs> and when we look back over the, the year that we have been through, obviously it's been a very turbulent year and it hasn't, um, you know, it hasn't been a year, I guess, of organizations innovating because they want to, um, you know, capture market share, so to speak. It's probably been more of a, maybe a more of a reactive year where organizations have been forced to make significant changes, whether it's people working all over the country in their home offices or whether supply chains have been disrupted because, um, you know, we, we no longer can do X, Y, or Z or, or whatever the many different cases have been. But how, how do you see, pro, how has process played a part in the, the last year that we've had? Do you think it's been an important part, a valuable part? And if so, how? I, I doubt that many CEOs would say that process has played an important role in the past year. Right. Um, I mean, a separate issue is that is the difference between the role of the process person and the role of a manager. You know, increasingly, and I think in the future, even more so, process is going to be something that managers need to do, or at least right. need to have a very large part in doing it. In other words, if you say, does, does job X really need to be done? Could we eliminate job X and could we have A pass it to B without X even touching it? Right. And the, you get into, I mean, a process person can spend a lot of time doing that, but increasingly a manager needs their own tools to use to do the analysis and make the decision because things are moving so fast. Um, so, a lot of what's probably been done this past year has been management decisions and no, no process analysis or anything else. I mean, I've talked to a bunch of process people that, you know, interact with the newsletter, the, the website, and there's certainly been a bunch of work done on people working at home. Software tools have been developed, uh, procedures have been developed, rules have been developed. In other words, companies 
if you've got your whole task force working at home, you need to rethink the processes. Yes. Would otherwise have people in the office. And so there's, that's been done sort of automatically just by default. In some cases, it's been done by people who are really process people, business analysts. Uh, in some cases, it's just been done by managers. But there's been a response there. Uh, customers have changed. I mean, they're not coming into restaurants, or at least they're only starting to come back. Right. So all of a sudden, I mean, where I live, it went from having very few restaurants that offered out drive-through service to almost everybody having some kind of drive-through service. Right. Very, every, every very good restaurants set it up so you could drive to the front door and park your car, and they would bring it out in a bunch of packages. <laughs> so that's a whole new process for most people. Yes, they had to create. yes. Uh, again, did they have process people doing it? Uh, I don't know. Maybe some did, some of the large chains. But I have the feeling more of it that's local manager deciding it to survive. They had to offer curbside service, and he and the employees sitting down and coming up with a way to do it. Right, right. More of a Six Sigma response than, a, than an analytic response. Yes. Um, meetings, uh, people involved in meetings, people having using online services. Um, in that case, I think the customer culture is probably more important. Yes. Lots of people, older people particularly, who didn't weren't used to computers, weren't prepared to learn about computers, and all of a sudden they became prepared to learn. Y yes. They wanted to talk to their grandkids. They had to go online to do it. And, yes. Uh, and some of us, you know, who didn't want to use Zoom or whatever the current, <laughs> currently popular tool is, decided Ye to learn because Ye everybody else was suddenly doing it. Yes. And I don't know how much that'll carry over. In some areas, like process work, <laughs> it's very hard to teach people without face-to-face -face meetings. There's just yes. lots of analysis and design where you want to hold the papers and shuffle them around and point to things that, and draw diagrams for them, where it's, it's very easy to do face-to-face -face and it's, it takes a lot of work. And again, I, I have a background in structural design, so I know some of the tools. And yes, there are very fancy things you can do to display drawings and to set up subgroups in meetings and so forth. Uh, but very few people have the time or the understanding to do it. So yes. Most of, the, most of the instructional interactions are not there, not near the high end of what could be done. Right. Um, and so most people's experience of meetings online is probably not that exciting. Um, some of that will carry over. I mean, I worked with some HP people and HP has set up a worldwide system where you go into offices in different locations around the world and you connect up to HP headquarters in California. Right. They had, a, they had sales meetings where they would fly in salespeople from all over the United States once a month. A huge cost, you know. And yes. Gone, <laughs> you know, and they now have people walk into a room with computers all over one wall sit down comfortably and talk to each other. And it's set up so that you feel like you're in the same room. Right. Conversation. Yes. Are, are virtually life size. Yes. So that will probably stick. In other words, they'll, they'll go through and look at all the processes that involve bringing lots of people together at high cost and think, do we need it? You know, or can we get around it? And we might have stalled not doing it, but we won't. Yes. Um, a trickier one. I, I think process people did a lot of good in the last 20 years, 15 years. Automation has done more than companies realized or accepted because they didn't, for social and, and political reasons, they didn't want to lay people off. And so they went sort of went ahead dealing with with more people and hoping that attrition would handle it the current situation has laid off lots of people
Yes. And I don't think a lot, some of them will not come back. Right. These companies will realize that in fact, their processes were thinner, leaner and better than they thought. Right. And they'll just decide, you know, we've, we've laid them off. Let's rehire them carefully and see how many we in fact need. Yes. Um, so I think there'll be a lot of process work around documenting and figuring that out. But I think companies will will seek to improve their efficiency quite a bit during the as a result of this. Yes. And, and that's what we want. In other words, mm. it's, yeah. Yes, if you're losing a job, it's no fun. But on the other hand, productivity is what keeps the economy going. So yes, yeah, that's right. And and, and now we will create a lot of new jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think that you know, as as we look towards the future, there are a lot of new and exciting technologies that are are coming out we're, we're seeing robotic process automation we're seeing process mining where we're, we're seeing new ways of i guess conducting uh, process management that um, makes it cost effective um, and, and very attractive to an organization because it's no longer going to take years it's 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 going to take months if not weeks if not days to um, understand your process and using data to highlight the areas of opportunity or the areas of inefficiency. Um, but what, what do you see as being the future of BPM as we look to the next two, two three, five years time? Well, I mean, some of the things I've mentioned, in other words, recovering from the pandemic is going to occupy a certain number of process people just cleaning up and re-establishing businesses. Right. Um, I mentioned that we don't have anything really exciting. And so I don't see process work as going suddenly surging after yes. the pandemic. Right. Um, I think AI, in other words, the current round of AI is, is extremely powerful and seems to be ramping up very fast. Uh, seems to solve the problems that expert systems couldn't solve, which is to say they build the system and then the system continues to learn on its own. Right. And gets better. So I assume that that there'll be a huge amount of automation that will be based around um, around the use of AI. And that will be the major, the major driver. Well, I mean, some of it is just going to be infrastructure changes. Right. I mean, the United States has been a disaster in, in terms of climate change for the last four years. Mm. Uh, we now seem to be getting into the ready to do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, if we're serious. And, and the other thing is, I mean, we talked about electric cars, but electric cars are now happening. Yes. But that kind of transition takes time. It'll, you know, we won't do it in four years or maybe eight years, but in 20, we're going to be a, a electric car driven. Probably don't need gas stations. I mean, don't need service stations at all. Most of the electric yes. charging I've seen has been in parking lots or in garages. So people need to have things installed in their homes or parking lots need to be rearranged to have electric chargers. But in other words, and, and that all costs money, but, you know, it, it costs money, it costs processes, it creates new jobs, and those are all going to need to be created uh, by companies. And I, I see that as being the main work of the, the next 10 years. For yeah, yeah. Responding to climate change, trying to make some real major changes, and having, creating the companies and having companies that exist modify themselves so they can do that uh and then and, and again it's like all process it includes people it includes training it includes software it includes computers it includes all the different elements and making them work together um but it'll you know i i think it'll certainly keep us busy yes yeah definitely definitely 
Well, Paul, obviously in a, in a 50 minute conversation, there's, there's only very few things that we can really scrape the surface on. Um, we, we could continue to talk for hours um, to just to try and delve into these topics more. But um, I think, um, you know, the, the, what we have talked about today, what we have discussed, I think that our audience is going to glean a lot from. Um, and so I, th I think that, you know, the goal of this is to challenge mindsets, to challenge thinking, um, to spark those conversations so that, you know, process can be brought into the conversation more because I truly believe it's a, it's a very valuable thing that organizations need to adopt and understand what, whatever that's going to look like as we move into the future. Um, but, but I believe it needs to be given, given time, attention and, and thought. Um, so I just want to thank you for um, sitting down with me today and, and sharing your, your knowledge and your experiences with us. If there's anything that any, any sort of last um, remaining sort of thoughts or comments you want to make, then we'd love to hear them. Uh, otherwise it's been an absolute uh, pleasure. I think I'll wrap it up. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. To all those process people out there.